I'd like you to take a Bible and turn to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. If you need a Bible, there's one in the rack in front of you. In those Bibles, it's page 813. Mark chapter 2. One of the great things about Jesus' teaching is he used lots of visual illustrations, lots of language uh, that we can understand to try to make very complex things simple and to enable us to, to grasp the depth of some of the just amazing, powerful things he's teaching. And so this morning, we have uh, a saying from Jesus, which I think if we lived in the first century context we might understand a little better. And so this morning, what we're going to do is a little bit of a science. Well, it is a science experiment. And uh, for this, I'd like to ask my daughter, Abigail, if she'll come help me uh, with this. We're going to do this uh, together. And we'd like to do a little science experiment to try to help make uh, clear what it is that Jesus is saying. So the verse we're thinking about, Mark chapter 2, verse 22 Jesus says, no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. Now, we don't have any wine up here, uh, but what we do have, tell you what, babe, why don't you give me your glasses, and you can put on your safety goggles, safety glasses, yep. We do have some yeast. Now, yeast is what you use in winemaking. Uh, the yeast interacts with the grapes, uh, and it causes them to ferment, and that's uh, where you get wine. And so what we're going to do is we're going to try to simulate uh, new wine and how that works. So we have some yeast. So uh, Abigail, you want to pour the yeast into our very scientific flask that we have? Okay, pour that all in there. All right, that's our yeast. Now, what's going to happen is, is we're going to try to speed up what normally happens when uh, new wine is being made. And so we're going to use some dishwasher soap. So if you want to take the just washing up soap, uh, put a bunch of that in there. This doesn't actually change the experiment at all, but let's put a little more. Why not? It's a second service. We'll see what happens. <laughs> okay, that's good. Um, it doesn't actually change the experiment, but what's going to happen is we're going to see you, what's going to happen is some gas is given off, and you wouldn't be able to see that. So what the dishwasher liquid does uh, is it captures it in bubbles uh, so that you can see what's happening. And then it's wine, so we should use some red food coloring uh, just to kind of get the, the feel. So let's add some red food coloring to it. Yeah, put a bunch in there. That's great. Okay. Now stir it all up. Yep, nice and lots of it. Yep, keep going. Yeah. All right, let's see. Now, I forgot to pour this for you. This uh, is hydrogen peroxide. So what we're going to do is we've got to pour some of this in here for you. Okay. Hold on a second. So normally what would happen is... <laughs> <laughs> Normally what would happen is, is that the yeast interacts with the grapes uh, to form wine and carbon dioxide is given off. Uh, we can't simulate that, but the hydrogen peroxide will interact with it and what's given off is oxygen. Uh, and so that's what's supposed to happen. So Abigail, go ahead. Why don't you pour that hydrogen peroxide in there and let's see how this goes. <laughs> Woo! Lots of heat. Good job, babe. Thanks for helping. Yeah, it's warm. <clears throat> Pretty cool, huh? Now, what do you think would happen if that was inside of a dry, crusty, hard wineskin? It would burst the skin. That's the idea. Now, we've sped up the process, but it's the same idea. You have yeast that is interacting with grapes, and they would be giving off carbon dioxide, and the idea is it's going to expand. There's going to be expansion that takes place, and so Jesus says, 
Nobody puts new wine into old wineskins or else it will burst the wineskins. Now, that's what that statement means, okay? We, if we lived in the first century or if we were winemakers, we might be able to understand that. We've done this illustration to try to show you. This is what happens scientifically is you have expansion that's taking place. But the important question for us is, what does this teaching refer to? Okay, we know what it means. We, we know now what it means is that new wine expands. It would burst the wineskins. The question is, what is Jesus wanting us to understand from this? Last week when we talked about doctors, that was a metaphor for the idea that Jesus brings a cure, salvation, rescue. So the question today is, when he says no one pours new wine into old wineskins, what does this refer to? Well, let's go now and read the entire passage that we're going to be studying this morning. Verses 18 to 22 of Mark chapter 2. It says, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? <clears throat> Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. So this very important teaching about new wine and old wineskins comes in the context of Jesus being asked a question. And it's a question about a religious uh, observation, a, a religious habit that is fasting. And some people noticed that the disciples of John the Baptist and the Pharisees and their disciples fasted, but Jesus' disciples did not. Now, fasting was a common Old Testament practice. It was something that you did to draw near to God and to try to connect with God. And so it was widely practiced in Judaism at the time of Jesus as evidenced by the fact that John the Baptist disciples fast and the Pharisees and their disciples fast. And so someone raises a question and says, well, Jesus, why don't your disciples do this? This is an important religious practice. It's part of our heritage why don't your disciples engage in it? And as is so often the case with Jesus, he gives an answer to the question, but then he uses the question to launch into a bigger teaching. The immediate answer to the question, Jesus says, is, well, why would they? After all, the purpose of fasting is to draw near to God and to try to hear from God. Jesus is essentially saying, I'm God incarnate. I am present with them. There's no need for fasting. If they want to talk to me, they just walk over and talk. If they want to draw close to me, they just spend time with me. Now he does say, a time is coming when I will not be physically present on this earth when he will ascend to heaven. He says, then my disciples, meaning those 12, and us today, will fast. And we will do it for the same reason, which is, God is not physically present on this earth for us to be able to talk to him or physically draw close to him. And so fasting is an important practice that allows us to draw near to God, but for a short window of time in human history... God himself was literally present on the earth. And Jesus says, there's no reason for fasting at that point. Now that's the quick and easy answer to why your disciples don't fast. But Jesus launches into this discussion about new wine and old wineskins, which tells us he's actually got a bigger point that he wants to talk about. 
Fasting and religious observations are just an opportunity for Jesus to make a bigger point. Now, to recognize the bigger point that Jesus is making, we need to understand that this passage that we just read comes in the context of some other things going on in Mark 2 and 3. See, one of the downsides of just picking a passage and going through it is that sometimes you can miss the forest because of the trees. You can forget that the passage we just read has stuff that comes before it and stuff that comes after it. This is one of the blessings and benefits of being able to preach through the entire Gospel of Mark. Now, it's going to take us some time, but the important thing is we get to go through story by story, and we get to hear and experience this book exactly the way the Holy Spirit wrote it. Now, some of you have been with us as we've gone through the Gospel of Mark. If you haven't, that's perfectly fine. You're here this morning. You're going to hear it. But you've been with us and you might have noticed a change took place from Mark chapter 1 to Mark chapter 2. In Mark chapter 1, Jesus is being introduced. He's going around preaching that the kingdom of God is drawn near. He's calling disciples to himself. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's casting out demons. He's healing people. And everybody loves him. This is great. Everybody's good with this. Praise the Lord, what a blessing from God. Here is someone who is providing healing, rescue, who's teaching amazing things. But in Mark chapter 2, a very important distinction happens. Look over with me at verse 6 of Mark chapter 2. Verse 6. This happens in the story of the paralytic we looked at two weeks ago. A man's lowered through the roof and Jesus heals the man. But before he heals him, he says to him, Son, your sins are forgiven. And then verse 6. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And beginning in Mark 2, we now, for the first time in the gospel, have opposition. Opposition to Jesus. Mark 1, everybody loves him. This is great. Who doesn't love the guy that heals people? Who doesn't love the guy that casts out demons? Who doesn't love the guy that preaches? But in Mark 2, Jesus says, I forgive your sins. And now all of a sudden, the teachers of the law... Say, whoa, 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 you're not allowed to say that. Next passage in Mark 2, the one we looked at last week, verses 13 to 17. This was the story of Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners. Verse 16, when the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, so we find out that the teachers of the law from the previous story, the sort of fancy title for them is Pharisees, When the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Again, opposition. Someone questioning who Jesus is and what he's doing. Then we have our passage, which if you remember, the original question was, why do the Pharisees and their disciples fast? Now look at the passages that we'll be looking at next week, which come right after ours. Verses 23 and 24. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The disciples said to him, look, sorry, the Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Again, opposition. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, Jesus shows up in a synagogue. A man with a deformed and shriveled hand is there. Verse 5, Jesus looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. He said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees, those are the people with the stubborn hearts, went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. That's opposition. 
Now, interestingly, if you look at the next section in chapter 3, verses 7 through 12, crowds follow Jesus, no Pharisees, no opposition. Verses 13 through 19, Jesus appoints the 12, no Pharisees, no opposition, which means that what we have in Mark 2, 1 to Mark 3, 6 is a subunit within the gospel of Mark. We've got five stories, a paralytic, eating with tax collectors and sinners, our passage, this teaching on new wine and old wineskins, Jesus' disciples eating on the Sabbath, and then him healing this man on the Sabbath in the synagogue. And those five stories, before those five stories, no opposition. After those five stories, the next two stories, no opposition, which tells us there is a subunit in Mark's gospel that these five stories all fit together. So let's lay them out uh, to see how they might be connected. So here we have the first story. This was the paralytic. Mark 2, 1 through 12. That's a healing story. The man is miraculously healed. Mark 2, 13 to 17, that's an eating story. Why does Jesus eat with tax collectors and sinners? Our passage, Mark 2, 18 to 22, that's the new wine teaching. Mark 2, 23 to 28, that's an eating story. Why are your disciples eating grain on the Sabbath? And then Mark 3, 1 to 6, that's a healing story. Now, if you listen, you're going to hear a rhythm. Healing, eating, teaching, eating, healing. Do you hear the rhythm? Okay, this is a common literary technique. We don't use it as much in modern era, but it was popular in the ancient era. It's all over the Bible, and it's something that you can call an A, B, C, B, A pattern. Did you hear that? A, B, C, B, A. Healing, eating, teaching, eating, healing. It's also called a chiastic structure. C-H-I-A-S-T-I-C. Chiastic structure. And the reason it's called that is if you laid it out differently in two columns, healing, eating, eating, healing, and then you connected like entities, what letter does that look like? An X. In Greek, the X is a key or a chi. That's the X symbol in Greek. And so that's where we get chiastic structure. It's a literary technique where you talk about something, you talk about something else, then you have a middle thing, and then you talk about the second thing you talked about, and then you talk about the first thing you talked about. So A, B, C, B, A. The reason it's called a chiastic structure is when you draw that X, and this is the literary technique, it's what's in the middle that's being highlighted. In modern terms, we tend to put the most important things either at the beginning or at the end, but there's an ancient literary technique that is this structure where the most important thing goes in the middle, and the things that are around it are all pointing into the middle, which means that the teaching that we have in Mark 2 explains what's going on in those other four stories, and those other four stories illustrate and make clear what it is that Jesus is trying to teach in Mark 2, verses 18 to 22. All right, you with me? So let's go back and look at those four stories again and see what they help us to understand about this teaching that Jesus is giving, which is about way more than just fasting. Story number one, Mark 2, 1 to 12, that's a healing story. Now, we said there was opposition. Who was the opposition from? The Pharisees, teachers of the law, meaning these are people who are well-versed in the Old Testament. Now, what was the charge, if you remember, that they leveled against Jesus when he said to the man, your sins are forgiven? Blasphemy. In other words, they're charging Jesus with violating the first commandment. So of the Ten Commandments... Number one is on issue here. You shall have no other gods before me. And the religious leaders and the Pharisees are saying, wait, wait, wait a second. 
When you just said that you can forgive sins, that's blasphemy. That's a violation of the first commandment. You're not allowed to say that. What's Jesus' response? The Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He says, I want you to know I have the authority to forgive sins. Second story. This is the eating story we looked at last week. Mark 2, 13 through 17. Who's the opposition? Still the Pharisees. Now, what's the charge? The charge is a lack of holiness. Okay, they say, why are you eating with tax collectors and sinners? Which is actually an accusation of breaking the second and third commandments. The second and third commandments have to do with the holiness of God. We do not take God or his name and associate it with profane, common, sinful sorts of things. It must remain separate and holy. And when the Pharisees see Jesus, who they think is a teacher or a prophet or some kind of religious person, they're not sure what to do with him. When they see him eating with tax collectors and sinners, to them this is a violation of the second and third commandment. He's not being holy. He's not honoring the holiness of God. What's Jesus' response? I'm the doctor. (laughs) Why would I stay away from sick people? I'm the doctor. It's my job to help them get better. Okay, third story. Mark 2, 23 to 28. We're going to again look at this uh, in the next one next week. Uh, But for the big picture idea here, this is an eating story. The opposition, again the Pharisees. Does anyone remember, I just read it briefly. Does anyone remember what the charge that the Pharisees made against the disciples in this story was? Sabbath, which is the fourth commandment. A violation of the fourth commandment. Jesus' response, verse 27 and 28 of Mark 2. Then he said to him, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is saying, hey, look, I made this thing. (laughs) I get to decide how it's used. Fourth story. Healing story. Opposition, still the Pharisees. Charge is the same as the third one. It's happening on the Sabbath, which is a violation, so they think, of the fourth commandment. And Jesus' response, chapter 3, verse 4, Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. And Jesus' response is, I'm here to give life. Now, if we look at these four stories, what they're doing is notice they are playing the opposition against the person of Jesus. Every one of his responses is something about who he is as a person. In other words, look at how Mark and the Holy Spirit and Jesus have set this up. It's Jesus versus the Ten Commandments. Commandments 1, 2, 3, and 4, the first tablet of the Ten Commandments have to do with man and our relationship with God. And notice how this has been set up. Those first four commandments are in opposition to Jesus, or at least we could say the Pharisees' interpretation of the first four commandments. But did you hear what I said? This is being set up as Jesus versus the Ten Commandments. Now, if at this point your mind is starting to expand Do you feel the experiment? Do you feel things pushing against categories? Wait a second. What do you mean Jesus versus the Ten Commandments or the Pharisees' interpretation of the Ten Commandments? Do you understand why Jesus is going to talk about new wine and old wineskins? The idea, do you feel the pushing, the bursting of categories? The idea that there is pressure on what we thought about the Ten Commandments or what we thought about the Old Testament or how the Pharisees were viewing things? That's what's going on in this passage, which brings us to the teaching. 
Jesus says, okay, look, there's a couple things you need to understand here. Number one, verses 19 to 20. Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. My wedding day was almost 20 years ago. I remember it quite well. It was a great day. It was an amazing day. It was a day that changed the trajectory of my life and set me off on an amazing path with a new life uh, with my wife, Lisa. Do you think I fasted on my wedding day? For those of you who are married, did you fast on your wedding day? No, nobody fasts on their wedding day. Why not? It's a good day, right? It's a celebration. That's Jesus' point. Look, what you've got to understand is me showing up on earth. That's a good day. This is a good day. The idea that the Son of Man has come with the authority to forgive sins, that's a good day. That God is among us forgiving our sins, that's a good day. The fact that God actually wants to hang out with tax collectors and sinners, that's a good day. The fact that God didn't just make rules to control our lives, but God brought us rules to help bless us, but that those rules don't have to be used legalistically, that's a good day. The idea that God showed up on this planet not to condemn us, but to save us, not to destroy life, but to save it, that's a good day. Do you see how these four stories are meant to make that point? Jesus is saying, with my presence here on this earth, it's a good day. Day and the beginning of something great. Second point he makes, verses 21 and 22. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will tear from the old, pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they put new wine into new wineskins. What's Jesus saying here? It's not only a good day, it's a new day. Something new is happening. We got new cloth, we got new wine. The idea is it's a new day. The problem was in the Old Testament with the Ten Commandments, as wonderful and as great as they are, the problem is is that the Ten Commandments can't help you. The point is all the commandments can do is accuse you of blasphemy and declare you to be a sinner. All the commandments do is let you know you're a tax collector and a sinner and God can have nothing to do with you. All the commandments let you know is, is you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do that, you're not allowed to break this rule. And all the commandments can do is bring death and not life. Now listen, this is not the Old Testament versus the New Testament. But it is an acknowledgement that because of the sinfulness of humanity and the holiness of God, in the Old Testament, humans' interaction with God more often than not brought death and destruction and separation and difficulty. But Jesus is saying the God of the Old Testament has now come in bodily form because he loves you and he loves me and he loves tax collectors and he loves sinners and something new is happening. Jesus is not here to bring Judaism 2.0. This is something new. It's something unheard of. Yes, the Old Testament pointed to it. But what is happening in the person of Jesus is new. What's the old wineskin? The old wineskin is the old legalistic way of thinking that came out of the Pharisees' interpretation of the Old Testament. And Jesus says, it's a new day. It is a new day. Now listen to his two points. Verses 19 to 20, it's a good day. Verses 20 to 20, 21 to 22, it's a new day. Do you hear that? It's a good day, it's a new day. It's good, it's new, good, new, good, new. This is the good news. It's the gospel. Mark begins his story with the beginning of the good 
news of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. This subunit is designed to teach us what does it mean that it's good news? It means it's a good day because Jesus has shown up to forgive sins, to hang out with sinners, to make sure the rules are a blessing and not a curse, and to save us and not destroy us. And it's a new day because God is now free in Jesus to do stuff that the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the law simply couldn't do. Paul tells us if there was any way for God to write a law that would bring life, he would have done it. It's not possible. What's Jesus' point? The good news is about a person. (laughs) The good news is that Jesus has come in the flesh. It's not about rules. It's not about regulations. It's not about systems. And the point is, in Jesus is life. Infinite, eternal, all-powerful, omniscient, compassionate, merciful life. And that life cannot be contained by the systems of this world. That when God stepped into the world, the governments of the world, the systems of the world, the democracies, the capitalisms, the communisms, the socialisms, the monarchies, the systems of this world cannot hold him because he is expanding beyond all bounds and all means. Even the Old Testament and the Ten Commandments, as great and wonderful as they are, cannot contain the infinite majesty and glory of Jesus. Because in him is life, and life is alive. And all those old wineskins, they burst at his presence. This is the good news. The good news is not Christianity is a better religion than Judaism or Islam or Buddhism or secularism. The good news is not, here's a set of rules that you can follow that will make your life work better. The good news is not, here's a set of ideas and doctrines for you to believe that will make you correct and right. The good news is that God has come in the person of Jesus and that you and I can have a relationship with the infinite source of life. It's about a person. It's not about a set of laws. It's not about a set of rules. It's not even about all these beautiful, amazing, infallible, God-given words that God has put in here. It is about the fact that the infinite, eternal God has come to dwell among us in the person of Jesus and that what God is offering to us is a relationship with him, a relationship with Jesus, not a set of rules, not a bunch of things to follow, not a whole bunch of stuff to pray and fast over, as great as all that is. This is why the discussion of fasting launches Jesus into this bigger conversation. It's not ultimately about Bible reading or fasting or prayer or going to church or all these wonderful, great, God-given activities. It's about one thing, a person. A man who is 100% human and also completely and totally God. And the good news is that the living God, who is the source of all life, all joy, all peace, anything good that can possibly exist comes from God. This God chose to become one of us and with open arms invite us to embrace him and experience in him life. What are we thankful for this Thanksgiving? Jesus. Not a system of rules. Not a religion. Not a way of thinking. Not a set of doctrines. Not a list of good practices. A living, breathing, resurrected person who none of the systems of this world, 
No theologies, no philosophies, no forms of thinking, no ways of doing things, no patterns, nothing in the entire world in which the universe itself cannot contain the life that is within him. That person is being given to us to dwell in our hearts by faith, that through his spirit, he is with us today and tomorrow and for all of eternity. We're thankful for Jesus. Let's pray together. Jesus, we do feel our minds expanding like new wine in old wineskins. Thank you that you've come to teach us. Thank you that you've come to give us life. Thank you, Lord, for blowing our categories. Oh, Lord, all of us grew up with ideas and have today even ideas and thoughts of who you are and how you have to interact and what you have to do. Thank you for being bigger and better than anything we could ever hope for or imagine. Thank you for being better than all the systems of all the wisdom of all the world and all the universe. Thank you that you've come to give us life. Forgive us for the ways in which we've tried to be old wineskins to your new wine. That we've tried to control you and manipulate you and hold you in. That we've tried to make you tame and safe and controllable. Thank you that you are none of those things. Thank you that you are love and light. And that you are with us. And thank you that your life overflows and that through you, streams of living water that will never cease and never end can flow in us. Jesus, what else do we have to be thankful for except you? Heaven has nothing we desire except you. Earth has nothing that we want but you. And so this Thanksgiving, Jesus, we stop and say thank you. Thank you for choosing to become one of us for all of eternity. That we might be with you and you might be with us. And we praise you and thank you. Amen.